Whatever the language of your choice may be, if you have ever studied the biblical text, you may have noticed that God has multiple names in it. Contextually, we could say that he is an entity defined by a plurality of words. However, epistemologically speaking, not all his names are equal, and each name holds information, which can only be retrieved by accessing the words presented as they are without any modification. Today we will achieve this through a systematic semantic analysis, including language rendition criteria within all translation spectra. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. On this series we explore, translate and discuss the Bible as an ancient text, trying to seek the most respectful, literal and coherent translation of the original Hebrew word, without any filters attached. Methodologically speaking, we will apply an empirical translation formula, namely, we will try to correlate with the ancient authors. We build a tether as we present and examine the raw data through the principles and paradigm of Western theory and practice of translation, while aiming at a high level of semantic precision. After showing you the literal words, we then apply period, cultural contextualization, hopefully reaching the best translation outcome possible. I am not here to change what you think, but to build upon it. To what I offer, you add whatever you feel is right based on your own knowledge and or faith. And to everyone out there, let me remind you that atheists and theists are all welcome here. Why is it important to present the words as they are? Well, primarily this is a secular video, therefore I only talk about language coherence. So from a secular standpoint, this is a matter of intellectual honesty, transparency and translation integrity. In other words, if you change anything from a translated text or work, you have to justify each change. Now from a religious standpoint, specifically for Christians, check out these passages. With all that being established, let's prepare to deep dive. Appearing over 2,500 times in the Bible, and mostly found in narrative passages, Elohim is not only the very first name for God we are given, but it's also a central core word within the ancient text. It first appears in Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. Even though it's translated as God, the original word, Elohim, is grammatically a plural and is often preceded by the article, which disappears in translation. Let me demonstrate jumping into interlinear. So, the Elohim, or the gods, would be a grammatically accurate literal translation, taking into consideration the numerical plurality of the word ending, which usually defines masculine plural. To make that even more complex, Take into consideration the fact that the word Elohim is normally followed by both verbs in singular form and verbs in plural form. Etymologically speaking, so when it comes to the origins and evolution of this word's semantic field through time, there is a very likely connection between the plural Elohim and the singulars El and Eloah. However, the etymology of the word Elohim is believed to be prehistoric. As a result, the gathering of information is limited at best or completely out of reach, more often than not. The word Eloah appears more than 70 times in the Old Testament, mostly in poetic passages. It could originate from a root with the meaning of terrify or to be afraid. The word El, which may structurally function as a stem, is the one that can be more consistently translated as God, singular. We use the word El many times in our daily lives without even realizing it. See, for example, the ending of angelic-inspired names, such as Michael, Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, Uriel, etc. Moreover, you may be surprised that we also find it in the entertainment industry, and it has been there for decades. See, Superman's name, Cal El. Shouldn't surprise us that a being with incredible supernatural powers coming from the sky has El in his name, considering the fact that the writers and creators of Superman are in fact Jews. So is Elohim plural or singular? Well, I'll address this section in details on its own part on section 6, but let me say this. Linguistically speaking, it is rather complex. So get ready for it. 
All in all, contextual usage gives us access to valuable data for qualitative assessment of translation in all available corpora. Professional rendering of language synthesis includes poetic balance, suitability to genre, arrangement of sections, poetic sequence, text analysis, literary devices. Thus, the criteria to choose designations and to interchange them for Elohim must be cultural and sociolinguistic before being doctrinal. This word appears more than 6,800 times in the Bible. It is referred to as the Tetragrammaton, a Greek term meaning the four letters. Now the reason why that number may seem surprising and you don't feel like you've seen it that many times in the Bible is because usually it's rendered in translation as God or the Lord and when it comes to the Italian translation God or the Eternal. Now the Jewish version of the Bible has it of course but the Jews don't read it and substitute it with Adonai, a plural term which means lords. I'll get to that in a minute. Now, just like we did with the word Elohim, after knowing the number of times that it appears in the Bible, we want to know when is the first time that this word ever appeared in the biblical text. Well, to answer that, you'll have to get ready to some real investigative work. Probably the best part of this video. You're gonna love it. But before I can show you that, I need to tell you a thing or two about the four letters themselves and give you a little background on Semitic languages. The Hebrew language, just like all Semitic languages in its original form, was written without vowel pointing, so only consonants, and you would fill in the vowels when reading. This is true of all Western languages before the Greeks developed an alphabet that included vowels. Hence, the entirety of the Old Testament was initially not vocalized. Now, there are some letters within the Hebrew alphabet that do function as vowel indicators or mater lectionis, but for all intents and purposes, no explicit vocalization. The Bible is an enigma. As time progressed, naturally, there were difficulties maintaining the proper pronunciation of this, which eventually was obscured by disuse. Particularly after the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BC, and even more so after the 3rd century BC when the Jews stopped using the name. No one at any time, save the priest in the Holy Temple of Jerusalem, could pronounce this word. Traditionally, he would read it in the temple once a day during the priestly benediction that is found on chapter 6 of Numbers. Then, on the Day of the Atonement, the most solemn of the Jewish religious holidays, the high priest would pronounce the Tetragrammaton ten times. After the Imperial Roman Legion Legio Decima Fretensis, led by the Roman general Titus, destroyed Jerusalem, one of the last strongholds of the rebellion in the siege in 70 AD, the Second Temple was destroyed and the exact vocalization became an item of debate. See section 4 on this video for further details. If you google that question, you'll be told that the first time that this word or this name appears in the Bible is in Exodus 14.3. This is when God speaks to Moses. Still, is this really the first time that this word appeared in the biblical text and no one knew it or even used it before? Well, the answer to this question may be found in the four letters themselves. Check this out. The Tetragrammaton is made of four Hebrew letters, Yod, He, Vav, He. In Jewish gematria, a numerological system by which Hebrew letters correspond to numbers, the numerical values of the letters of the Tetragrammaton are indicated as 10, 5, 6, 5. When added together, their sum equals 26. Now stay with me. Let's apply these numbers, 4 and 26, to the Bible as we ask the question, when was the first time that Yehovah appears in the text? Well, what's the first book in the Bible? The book of Genesis. So, Genesis 4, verse 26. Well, it so happens that chapter 4 of Genesis does have 26 verses, so let's read verse 26. And as for Seth, also to him was born a son, and he named him Enos. Then began to call on the name of. There it is. The first time then the Tetragrammaton was ever used, and the very first time that it appears in the text. So according to this investigation, Adam and Eve didn't use it, neither did Cain and Abel. It was at the time of Enosh that men started to invoke the name or the epithet, and it's the very letters and their numeric meaning that tell us that. Fascinating. The information being embedded within the name. 
This word was written down probably 400 years after being pronounced for the first time. It was then vocalized possibly 1,600 years after being pronounced in a language we don't know. And considering the fact that Moses is traditionally placed between the 14th and 15th century BC, whatever language this was, it was not Biblical Hebrew. Was it uttered in Proto-Semitic or perhaps in a dialect of Levantine, Northwest Semitic? What we do know is that the word is a lot more ancient, which, if we were to believe the Genesis chapter 4 verse 26 account, it would fit. The word is prehistorical. Regardless, Yahweh is considered the most probable and coherent vocalization of this. It contains the sound Ya, which is known to be the shortened version of Yahweh. You say it every single time you sing or say Alleluia, praise Ya. An alternative vocalization would be Yehovah, which would be the basis for the English word or name Jehovah. Yehovah is a vocalization based on the application of the vowels of the word Adonai into the tetragrammaton. Even though less praised by linguistic consensus when compared to Yahweh, it does have its points of strength. For instance, the fact that in Hebrew, the letter He, when it's found at the end of a word, can be read A, such as in the word for love. Ahava. Moreover, Yehovah is trisyllabic, which could be consistent with how the tetragrammaton was intended to be read. With that being said, you can also achieve a trisyllabic pronunciation by pronouncing Yahweh. Given the English pronunciation Jehovah is the result of a corruption due to a Latin transliteration, which basically rendered in English the pronunciation as a J, with that being said, well, so is the word Jesus a anglicized pronunciation and version of the name Yehoshua, Yeshua, Yeshu. Therefore, when speaking English, Jehovah is acceptable. But apart from the biblical Genesis account, how do we know that the word Yehovah is in fact that ancient. The thing is that the word is found in several surrounding cultures and mythologies. For example, in the Phoenician tradition, there is a god called El, and El tells us he has a son named Yehovah. These letters, identified as the god of the heavens, are also found in the Akanemid religion and royal ideology. Similarly, Yehovah appears here and there historically often connected with the concept of the God Most High, developed in religious systems of Syria, Canaan in the first millennium BC. Furthermore, among ancient Egyptians' designations for type of foreign peoples in the New Kingdom period, the term Shasu, which normally is associated with nomads, is connected to the name. And there are two significant hieroglyphic inscriptions that refer to a landmass called the Land of the Shasu of Yahweh. In the presence of the ever-shifting perception of a deity which appears to be trans-regional, Yahweh appears to be dynamic in a way, and his shadow as a sky god is found in many different cultures throughout time, delineating him as an ancient warrior god and talking about war. Third in frequency among divine names, the name Shaddai appears 48 times in the Bible, seven times as El Shaddai. Whenever we find the word omnipotent or all-powerful, in the original text we have Shaddai or El Shaddai. This is, for example, how God introduces himself to Abraham before he became Abraham. Well, let's begin by saying that we don't have a precise and identifiable translation of the actual meaning of Shaddai, but what we do know for sure is that it does not mean omnipotent or all-powerful. Note, of course, that I'm not saying that God isn't all-powerful. I'm just saying that the word Shaddai does not mean it in this specific texts. Therefore, the translation being incoherent. So what does El Shaddai mean? Even to this day, the meaning is uncertain. I am God Shaddai. But the word Shaddai is no name. It's an epithet, meaning an adjective or phrase expressing a quality or attribute regarded as characteristic of the person or thing mentioned. So since we're looking at a descriptive quality, let's have a look at possible root meanings of this sound. Well, some linguists have proposed God of the mountain, God of the steppe, but there is a possible verbal root within this word which would express the meaning of destructive violence, lay waste, desolate, annihilate, destroy. So it could mean powerful in the sense of strong, but only in a destructive sense. And even though this may seem strange to us, let's remember that the God of the Old Testament is the Lord of Hosts. Interestingly enough, some see a possible double root to it, a contrasting element of destruction and life nurturing. 
To put it in context, for nomadic people, a good physical representation of this would be the power and awe of the sandstorm. Moreover, the usage of this word may not be just descriptive, but it may have some functions within the text itself. When it comes to the translation proper, Elohim is traditionally translated as God, always in singular form in the text whenever it refers to the God of the Israelites. This is a functional decision, not a literal nor a contextual translation, since the word in Hebrew is once again a plural. Any translation can be defined by its level of equivalence. Any shift in consistency must be justified by a lack of structural equivalence in the receiving language, given all text when moved from the source language to the receiving language undergoes a process of adaptation. However, such transformation should occur through processes such as functional consistency. If any translation requires morphological transformation of a more radical kind, whether for linguistic consistency or aesthetic quality, any stylistic or semantic changes should be indicated in the text or avoided altogether. The philological crux implied with the plurality of the name of God in one of the greatest monotheistic religions, doctrinally speaking, has already been addressed, of course. Some say it's a superlative indefinite, a plural of abstraction, a pluralis maestatis, a plural of sovereignty, a pluralis excellentiae, an honorific plural, and so forth. And among Trinitarian Christian is seen as a proof of the doctrine of Trinity, specifically within the plurality, in the Godhead. Now I'm not here to discuss nor dispute any of these because it would transcend the work of the translator. They are doctrinal, hence they regard the field of theology. I will however address, attack and dispute a more structural explanation of the plurality of Elohim which is normally presented as an excuse or a system to understand when Elohim is a plural noun and when it's singular. The reason being is that this is in fact linguistic in nature, so it does pertain to my field of expertise. If the name Elohim is followed by a singular verb, it's the God of the Israelites. On the other hand, if the name Elohim is followed by a verb in plural form, then it's talking about heathen deities. On top of that, you'll hear that another explanation for Elohim being followed by verbs in plural forms is because it's actually meaning angels or judges. So, Elohim with singular verb, that's the God of Israel. But Elohim with plural verbs, angels, judges, heathen deities. Now, of course, if you read this, I mean, it makes logical sense, so if you don't have access to the Bible, you may be inclined to believe it. But there is only one problem with this explanation. It's false. Let me prove it to you. This translation mechanism has been in use for a long time. In a few cases, in the Greek Septuagint, we have the Hebrew word Elohim with plural verb translated indeed as angeloi, even though we know exactly what the word for angeloi, meaning angels, in the Hebrew text is, being malach, malachim. If you want to know more and have a deep dive about the malachim, check out this video of mine link in the description. However, with my opinion and interest in the world of translation and my personal professional experience, I reject this rendition. Elohim is something else, much more powerful than the Malachim or the angels. So changing it into angels is intellectually lacking rigor from a secular standpoint and from a religious standpoint. It is blasphemous. These passages then enter the Latin Vulgate, the rest is history. So let me prove to you, with the Bible, why this system is wrong and how it collapses the moment you put it to test. Genesis 20, 13. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I can already stop. This little passage proves the system wrong. Abraham is speaking here. This entire story that follows comes from the idea that God, so Elohim, caused him to wander from his land. We have the beginning of the story of salvation, the pact or alliance with God, the promised land, miracle children. Everything is ignited from this verse. Well, in this case, the verb is in plural form with Elohim. So, if we were to apply this system, the God of miracles, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob, the God that did the promised land that brought everything to pass, is either a heathen God or a judge or an angel. Didn't think so. Now, even though Elohim as a term is generic, I believe that Elion and El Elion are instead specific. It is another case of an epithet and it's describing another quality, specific to the El 
that is being described. A lion is in the comparative form and it means the upper one or the one higher than the rest. This is sometimes translated in English and in Italian as the highest, although that's a superlative, so it's not really a great translation. The one above all others in comparative is the best translation. A lion also carries the idea of a commander and he's the one that is distributing the inheritance of nations. A critical analysis can also strengthen this idea of this term not being a name but an epithet with an adjectival nature by reading the text. Since we find it both in masculine form when it's referred to God and in feminine form, so Eliona, when talking about, for example, buildings as in Ezekiel, the one above even though the possibility of connecting comparative and superlative degree all in one as a merged form is also possible, the elative. As one last interesting aspect, we often find other epithets to describe God, for example, eternal, everlasting. Still, the majority of these are not in fact present in the text, the original word, when you find these, still being Yahweh. As we continue to seek high fidelity in the usage, rendition and equivalent within any given translation in a broad sense and in the interpretation of the biblical word, we must always strive for honesty in presentation. And this video, of course, is nothing but a first step into the fascinating world of biblical translation and in general, biblical semantic sphere. If you like this sort of video, make sure to check out the other episodes of this series. You will find all of them linked in the description. And as always, if you're not yet a member of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. May your journey lead to light, knowledge and truth. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.